Hello, and thank you for joining our Fancy Learning Lounge talk on lactation support for your transgender patients. My name is Whitney Lindenmeyer, and I use she, her pronouns. I am a spokesperson for the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics and an assistant professor of nutrition at St. Louis University. And my research and clinical practice center on nutrition care with the transgender population. I do want to note that I am not transgender myself and am not speaking on behalf of the transgender population. I identify as cisgender, meaning my sex assigned at birth and gender identity are the same. So my perspective that I'm sharing today is as a dietitian who primarily works with the trans community. So we have just a short period of time with you today. So we are sharing some key focus areas on this topic related to gender affirming language, considerations regarding physical touch when providing lactation support, some of the known challenges with lactation based on the existing research and proposed solutions to best caring for your transgender and gender diverse patients. So first we'll start with some gender affirming language and communication with your gender diverse patients. Gender affirming language is truly the first and foundational step for really any healthcare provider to build rapport with their gender diverse patients. It signals that you respect your patient and that you're honoring their gender identity, something that unfortunately many trans patients have not faced in our healthcare system. So this includes using the patient's name and correct pronouns, which may be well documented in the patient's electronic medical record. And if not, we can simply introduce ourselves with our pronouns and then invite the patient to share their name and pronouns too. So for the purposes, purposes of this talk, we want to focus specifically on some of those key terms commonly used surrounding lactation, which you can see from this list here are fairly gendered or female specific. So some of those terms like breastfeeding, mommy mother, maternal care, or the mother baby unit of a hospital. And here we offer a short list of gender neutral alternatives for patients that may be uncomfortable with the female specific terms, terms such as chest feeding or lactation, the birthing parent or perinatal care. And I do wanna make the point that we are not advocating that dietitians completely switch to gender neutral language. And in fact, some transgender patients, especially those that identify as trans feminine may truly prefer those spe female specific terms. So for that reason, let's not assume what our patients prefer. I know there's some heated uh, discourse on this topic, both among the general population and in our own profession. So I'd like to just take a moment to remember that our role as nutrition professionals is not to judge our patients against our own biases, but rather to support our patients in making healthy choices for themselves and their babies. And we know that lactation is hard enough. Per that CDC data, less than half of infants are exclusively breast or chest fed uh, through three months. And then about one in four infants are exclusively breast or chest fed uh, at six months. So let's do everything in our power to help our patients breast or chest feed successfully. If that's something as simple as using the term chest fed instead of breast fed, sign me up. So we can simply ask our patients what terms they want to use listen to what they tell us, and then follow through and use those terms consistently. And if we slip up, I know sometimes nutrition professionals are concerned that they're gonna make a mistake. We can simply acknowledge the mistake, correct it, and then move right along. So next we wanna bring up a few considerations regarding physical touch. So often lactation support will involve exposing the chest area and physically touching our patients in order to help with things like positioning or latching. So we can keep in mind that this may put our gender diverse patients in a very vulnerable place and that many trans individuals have experienced traumatic experiences in a healthcare setting, such as providers being unwilling to touch them or even physical abuse. So a few best practices are to explain the purpose of the physical touch. For example, we could say something like, you know, there are different positions to hold your baby that they may be most comfortable for feeding and then to ask permission to touch our patients. For example, is it okay with you if I help to position your baby with your breast or chest to show you what those positions look like? Or something along the lines with pump sizing, um, we could say the size of that flange can cause pain or be less effective if it is too large or too small. Is it okay if I hold the flange to your breast or chest to see if what we have here is a good fit? Hello, my name is Jennifer Waters and I use she and her pronouns. 
I'm an instructor in the nutrition department at Benedictine University in Lyle, Illinois, and a doctoral candidate in the health sciences program at Northern Illinois University, where I'm studying the nutritional care of transgender and non-binary individuals with a focus on the training and development of nutrition professionals and students. I also do not identify as transgender myself and do not intend to speak on behalf of the transgender community. I am speaking from the perspective of a researcher, educator, and former clinical nutrition manager and practitioner. There may be some hurdles that your transgender patients face when it comes to infant feeding. As nutrition professionals, we have a unique opportunity to help our patients navigate and overcome these challenges so that they can have a healthy and productive feeding relationship with their babies. Many transmasculine or transgender men practice chest binding with an elastic bandage or another garment to masculinize the appearance of their chest. Chest binding can pose some obstacles to infant feeding, but certainly nothing that we can't work with them to overcome. Blocked milk ducts can occur if binding for longer periods of time or with too much pressure. As we know, this can cause painful mastitis. Simply guide your patient toward taking frequent breaks from the binders and to consider using less pressure. Binding can also affect the milk supply. Frequent breaks and reduced pressure should help, but since most new parents are usually not out and about much in the first couple of weeks, they also might be open to the idea of holding off on binding until they can establish a steady milk supply. Those who have undergone chest contouring procedures or top surgery may still produce some milk depending on how much mammary tissue remains and if milk ducts were not damaged in the process, but they may struggle to obtain a good latch. We may have to help them find an ideal position, uh, keeping in mind all the great tips that Whitney provided. Molding and cupping the chest tissue using the sandwich method is a useful technique. Uh, nipple shield may also help with positioning and latch. Testosterone therapy does, however, inhibit prolactin and thus reduces milk production. So if your patient would like to resume or begin gender affirming hormone therapy with testosterone, and they would like to still feed at the chest for the experience of bonding, a supplemental system with formula or donor milk can certainly be utilized. Transfeminine or transgender women may also be able to produce their own milk following a similar protocol that cisgender non-birthing parents would follow. Some of the challenges that they may face are around initiating and maintaining an adequate milk supply. Working with their provider to obtain an appropriate regimen of estrogen, progesterone, and galactagogues will be key to their success. They may also need to be on an anti-androgen medication to suppress production of endogenous testosterone. Additionally, just as with any patient trying to increase their supply, frequent pumping and feeding as often as possible are recommended to stimulate those prolactation hormones. It is important to keep in mind that for a transgender or non-binary parent, being in a clinical setting alone can leave them feeling very vulnerable. And in particular, since feeding at the breast or the chest is historically viewed as a very feminine practice, this can be especially triggering um, for transmasculine or transgender men. And in particular, since feeding at the breast or chest is historically viewed as a very feminine practice, it can especially trigger gender dysphoria for transmasculine or transgender men. Offering care that is supportive, sensitive, and family-centered, as well as following their lead when it comes to decisions around feeding are all very good strategies to set the stage for a positive and productive relationship with your patient and a happy and well-fed baby. Thank you so much for joining us. We welcome further conversation and would love to hear about your experiences working with the gender diverse community.